the purpose of DNA is to be able to build specific proteins. The DNA is going to have the code to build a very large number of proteins. And um, we're going to begin using the word gene to describe a section of DNA that has a specific code. And there's going to be a very um, large number of steps between the nucleotide code of DNA and the amino acid sequence of a protein. So that is one of the big things that we need to keep in mind, is that DNA has the code in nucleotides, and these codes are broken up into sections called genes. In humans, there are over 10,000 different genes or different sections. And some genes are going to actually create a protein like an enzyme. Others are actually going to be regulatory genes that help turn on and off other genes. So within the genome, we're actually going to see a significant amount of genetic information, of which we're going to use some of that to build specific proteins. This diagram is showing us what's called the central dogma. So these steps are known as the central dogma, which really just means the main idea of biology. But we do need to keep in mind that in order for every cell to be able to make the proteins it needs, we are going to need the entire genetic code in each cell. So what we'll be looking at in this section is really transcription, which is the first step. Um, what we want to talk a little bit of history about first is once we realize the DNA has the code to build proteins, <clears throat> there was some research on how exactly does the genetic code, how is it organized? So Beetle and Tatum are going to be given credit for part of the research on the organization of the genome. So how are those billions of human base pairs? The human um, genome has about 3 billion base pairs. It's about 6 billion nucleotides. How are they organized? And we just want a little bit of research on the idea that different sections code for different proteins. So their hypothesis was one gene, one enzyme. And they were looking at pathways that produced a product. So they were looking at a pathway, and what they realized is that there were different enzymes needed for different pathways, and that if one enzyme didn't work, a lot of times the whole pathway was stopped. So we do just want to realize where did the concept of a gene and these distinct units came from. And so the concept that distinct units produce a specific protein, they were concentrating on enzymes, but we know that there are other functions of protein. The difficult thing is that there are many times where those proteins interact. To have one end trait. So what they were looking at here is how do we make arginine? That was the trait that they were looking at, is the ability to make arginine. And what they were able to do was use radiation to damage certain parts of the DNA and prove that they that this was a pathway and different genes were involved in this pathway. And so where we go from here in the research is, well, how is a gene actually working? Okay, DNA is made of many genes, but how does that gene actually work? So we want to do a really quick overview of how a gene works, and then we want to look specifically at transcription. So, something that we need to add into our notes here is the concept that protein synthesis is the goal,
we're trying to build a protein out of amino acids, and that's what we have here in this diagram. DNA has the code. Except we begin to run into a problem here, because we're trying to do protein synthesis at the ribosome, and the DNA in a eukaryotic cell, or the DNA in any cell, is not going to go to the ribosome, especially since we have all of these genes that we might need to make at the same time. I might need to make protein A and B and protein C. And so I can't be sending my DNA to one ribosome. That's not very efficient. So the more efficient and more effective use of the DNA is to be able to get copies of specific genes. And so what we're going to see is a molecule called RNA. That's ribonucleic acid because it has the sugar ribose. Notice the M-E-O-S-E. -E, that's a sugar ending. And so ribonucleic RNA is going to, uh, ribonucleic acid is going to play an important role in using the DNA code to create proteins. So let's look at the role of RNA. The first step is going to be something called transcription. Notice the word in the middle there is script. And this is where we're going to take the DNA code so DNA code, specifically for one gene, is base paired to synthesize a copy. So I want a copy of that gene. Except we know that there's really no such thing as copying with the enzyme polymerase. So we're going to be seeing that we actually base pair and that this copy is called mRNA. And so it's really, we want to use this word, base pair. Now when I see the word script in here, I think of writing, like writing a manuscript. And so I like to, in my head, think of transcription as rewriting the DNA code. That's not the most official vocabulary. The official vocabulary is base, pair, and synthesize. But it, it really means that we're kind of rewriting it as RNA. But notice we're going from nucleotide to nucleotide, different types of nucleotides. But still, we're, we haven't made a protein yet. This has just gotten us a copy. Now, in eukaryotic cells, the copy is going to have to leave the nucleus. In prokaryotic cells, we still need to get the copy to the ribosome. So just noticing that in a eukaryotic cell, we do have this barrier of the nucleus. But the mRNA is going to travel. So mRNA, which travels to the ribosome. And this allows the DNA to be intact, and we can actually be transcribing many, many genes all at the same time. And each mRNA will go to its own ribosome to finish the job. And so the second stage is called translation. And this word actually, I think, makes a lot of sense as well. We're going from the language of nucleotides to the language of amino acids. So the word translation is actually a helpful name. So language of nucleotides, specifically RNA nucleotides, to the language of amino acids. Now, keep in mind, none of this is turning into the other thing. The mRNA actually isn't destroyed as we do this. So mRNA can actually do its job again and again and again. So if we need multiple copies of this protein, this mRNA can keep working for a while. So what translation is, is where the mRNA code is read. What does that mean, read? What it really means is that a codon or a set of three 
nitrogen bases will attract another type of RNA, a tRNA anticodon. And the tRNA's job is to bring amino acids. And those amino acids are going to be joined by the ribosome. And the ribosome is our rRNA, so our ribosomal RNA. So we're going to see three types of RNA, mRNA, the messenger RNA, tRNA, which transfers amino acids, and rRNA, the ribosome. So those are our three types of RNA. And we do want to be able to recognize their general shape and their general job. mRNA is usually a long single strand. tRNA will look a little bit more at this structure later, and rRNA is going to fold and make up the ribosome. We'll be focusing more on the structures later, but you'll want to be able to come back to these notes and identify them. There are some important differences between DNA and RNA. All of this, of course, is important for being able to build the protein. So important differences between DNA and RNA, they're both going to be a polymer. So the things they have in common is they're both polymers of nucleotides. Differences really come in the structure of the nucleotides. So they're going to have different sugars, deoxyribose sugar and ribose sugar in the RNA nucleotides. Here we're going to see that ribose does not bond with the nitrogen base binding. So it uses an alternate nitrogen base uracil. So we'll still have adenine guanine cytosine, but thymine, the structure of it, the functional groups, don't bond correctly with the ribose sugar. And so that's why uracil is used here. Another structural difference that we're going to see is that DNA is going to always be found double-stranded. RNA is going to be usually single-stranded. Both are going to be able to form base pairs and hydrogen bonds. We will see in some viruses that they have double-stranded RNA. So just a little review of the differences between them. And so what we really want to get to is how does transcription happen? And so we're going to real quickly try to cover that. There are three main steps. The first is initiation. The second is elongation. And the third is termination. Important points here is that the initiation is going to require what are called transcription factors. And these transcription factors are going to assemble at an initiator area. And this initiator area is going to occur upstream of the gene. So upstream of the gene, we're going to see transcription factors assemble, and this tells the enzyme RNA polymerase where to attract or where to come to. So it attracts RNA polymerase versus DNA polymerase. And so initiation is going to be when the enzyme binds and actually begins creating the um, mRNA sequence. Elongation is the addition of RNA nucleotides. We're going to use base pairs. We don't need a primer, so we do want to note no primer is needed because RNA polymerase does not need a primer. It can begin. It synthesizes in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction until it reaches an end point where it will actually stop. And that's really all that termination is, is the end of the gene, which is going to be a specific sequence.